wide open right now, God, because I know that you're going to be talking to many in this room today. So God, settle in our hearts that we would be open, that we would be prepared, that we will stay engaged. God, I thank you for this now. In Jesus' name, amen. Romans 12, verse 2. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. We're doing a, a series now called Transformed. It's going to be a brand new series. We're starting this morning. Transformed. The first message today is, what are you thinking about? What are you thinking about? Because the bottom line is this, is the way that we think, that's the way our life is going to go. How we think is the direction that our life takes. So what we think about involves and will involve everything that goes on in your life. Everything takes place in the mind first. James 1.15, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Now, read that again, because I know it's kind of like, what? What did he just say? After desire has conceived. So a, a desire, think of the word lust as desire. Don't think of it as sex, because that's not necessarily what it is. That's not a biblical way to describe it. It can be, of course, but it's really a desire. It's a craving. So when you've got a desire, you've got a lust, you've got a craving, and, and, and you begin to think about that, it says, after desire has been conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. So a thought turns into a sin, or turns into a, an action that's a sin, and that sin will turn into death, because the penalty of sin is death. That's what the Bible tells us. And so this is the way our thoughts go. If we're not careful, our thoughts will either lead us into life or they'll lead us into death. And a very simple thought can change everything in your life and in the lives around you if you're not careful. So the battleground for everything good and everything evil, the battleground for, for what we think about, whether it's life or death, is in the mind. That's the battlefield. That's the battleground. It's in the mind. Proverbs 23, 7. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he or her. As he thinks in his heart, so is he. And it's interesting because this, this scripture is actually taken from, uh, uh, out of Proverbs, it's taken from a place where it's actually saying, yeah, they're saying that, but what they really mean is this. And so what that also tells me is that you can look perfectly amazing on the outside, but something else can be going on in your mind. Something else can be going on in your heart and nobody else knows about it, but what you think about long enough will direct your life. And it will come out. And so we've got to be thinking about the things of God. We've got to be centered on Him. We've got to concern ourselves with His thoughts, what His thoughts would be for our lives, and not what our thoughts are. And guess what? Not what somebody else's thoughts are for your life. So just because someone said something over you doesn't make it true. Just because someone says something over you doesn't make it true. But many of us have believed lies that somebody else has said over us. Now, this is a simple one, but there's a good chance that even in a crowd like this, it's probably somebody that you've had somebody speak over to you, maybe more than once, and this is where, this is where things really become a problem. It's just spoken over you, and it's spoken over you, and they keep saying it. Let's just take an action here. Let's take one as an example. Your, your, your parents growing up, somebody who you should respect and do respect when you're young, they tell you that you're stupid. You're so stupid. Why do you always do that? Are you stupid? And they say it over and over to the place that it begins to get lodged into your brain. And now you're in your 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and you're still thinking that you can't do certain things. You, you can't perform as well with your mind because you're stupid. Because that's what they told me. And you believe the lie. And you may not even know where the root of that came from. You don't even remember that it was your parents that planted that in you long ago. But here you are 50 years later, and you're still battling with that thought. Still ba uh, battling with the thought that I'm stupid. Everything I do is stupid. Everything I do, it just turns out terrible. I just can't do things. I can't think straight. I can't think like other people. They're so good with their mind. I can't do that. And you believe the lie. 
One thing I want you to do is something I wrote down here is don't waste time thinking about what other people think about you. Don't waste time thinking about what other people think about you. You know, I, it's real easy for me uh, to get up here and, um, and I used to have a serious problem with this, but I used to think, what are they thinking? So I would be talking about a message. What are they thinking? I wonder if they're, wonder if they're okay with what I'm saying. I, I know there's that one person out there that they don't really believe the way that, I, that we believe here, and, and I just wonder what they're thinking right now, and it can, it can put you all caged up. And so we have to be very careful, in, even in our everyday lives, that we're wondering about what other people think about us. Because it will, it will change the way we will act. We'll become insecure. You know that one, one of the reasons that people say things like, you're stupid, you're dumb, or you'll never get it right, you'll never amount to anything. You know the reason, the biggest reason they say that is because they're insecure themselves. And so you're letting somebody else's insecurity affect your life. And it's a lie from the pit of hell. Because God didn't create you that way. God actually created you. If they said you're stupid, you're stupid, you're stupid, God actually created you to have the mind of Christ. And that's what the Word of God says. Who cares what they say? We go back to the Word of God and we say, what's the Word of God say? And we find the truth. Because nobody, nobody, nobody really has the right to tell you who, who you are, who you're going to be, how you're supposed to be, except God alone. And so you've got to lean into what God has for your life, what He says about your life. Let his thoughts dominate your thoughts. Let his words dominate your mind. Because if you allow the enemy to dominate you, guess what? He's going to bring in a stronghold. A stronghold is going to come into your mind and it's going to dominate you. A stronghold is anything that you believe, any, any, sorry, any lie that you believe. When we talk about demonic strongholds, I mean, you could, have a, you could have a God stronghold, too, in your heart. I mean, you just, you know that God loves you and it just becomes a stronghold, of, a place of strength a place of superiority, so to speak, in, in your own heart, where, where it's, it's a stronghold, it's a, it's a place, you know, where, where you can defend. But when the enemy sows a seed of doubt and unbelief and tells you about your character, tells you something that's against what God says you are, it's a lie, and that lie being said over and over enough on the inside of you becomes a stronghold if you believe it. If you believe it, suddenly there's this stronghold in me and I, I, I believe the lie. In fact, I'll come to a place where I even defend the lie. You're telling other people what this lie says about you. You're defending it. You're, you're, you're just reinforcing it. You've, you've taken it and you're just like, yeah, that's me. That's me. I'm, I'm this way. This is who I am. You've, you've made your identity over what somebody else's insecurity is. Because they want to feel better about themselves and it becomes this stronghold, this terrible uh, binding thing. I've, I've prayed uh, many times, many times, and I, I don't even know how many times, but I, I don't know why, but God's allowed me to see many times when I pray for people that there'll be a stronghold on their mind. And I, and I see it like a, a big metal band that has, it's almost like this Frankenstein thing, to be honest. It's this metal band that has, that has like screws on it and, um, and there's like a lock on it and, it and it's this stronghold that's just got your mind. You can't think straight. You, you can't think even, it almost seems like you can't think God thoughts. I can tell you that you can, but, but it just feels like I'm just so bound up. I can't think straight. All I think about is this, whatever that lie is. I can't, I can't, I can't release it. And I have no freedom in my life because all I do is I, I, I base everything off of what they told me in the past. And I, and I just can't break loose. There's a story in the Bible that most of us know about. If you know the Bible, just even a little bit, most of us have heard this. And it's about where, where Moses sends out the 12 spies to go into Canaan and to spy out the land. And little kids made a song about it and all that kind of stuff back when I was little. And, and so um, 12 spies go out and they go out into Canaan Canaan is the promised land. You've got to understand it first of all. Canaan's the promised land. This is the land that God has promised them. This is the land that God said, I will give you this. And he pulled them out of Egypt, which wasn't long before this story. He had already pulled them out of Egypt. He had parted the Red Sea. All these things happened. They saw the great miracles of God. And now they're, supposed, they're standing at the door. Like they're at the door. Like imagine yourself at your front door. You're about to go in. Well, you're, they're standing at the doorway, so to speak, of going into this land. 
And Moses says, we need to spy out the land. We need to know what we're up against here so that when we, when we, bring, when we bring the boom, we're going to know what's happening. And so, so he sends out the spies. For 40 days they go, and then they come back, and it says here in Numbers 13, 27, they gave Moses this account, we went into the land to which you sent us. And it does flow with milk and honey. Here's its fruit. Believe it or not, that the fruit that they showed him, they, they said that they had walked out with these giant vines of grapes that it took two men to carry. These things were massive. So the land was prosperous. It was flowing with milk and honey. It's all that God said it would be. Verse 28, but the people who live there are powerful and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. That's the giants. The Amalekites live in the Negev. The Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. Listen, they're, they're, saying, they're saying everywhere we go, it's beautiful, and it has such great things, but everywhere we look, the enemy's there, and they're big, and there's a lot of them. They're everywhere. And then verse 30, Caleb. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. They went and they spied out and they saw. And a lie came into their mind. They're stronger than we are. And then it turned into, we can't. We can't. And many of us in this room, you've got a we can't, I can't kind of mentality some kind of stronghold, something that happened in your life. And, and now as you're going through life, there's certain areas that it seems like you're doing pretty well in, but there's this, this area, this, and sometimes it affects multiple areas. I just can't. I can't. I can't. Well, why can't you? Well, I, can't. I just can't. And sometimes we know, and sometimes we don't even know. We, we don't know why we can't. We just can't. And there's this stronghold that's on the inside of us. And it will hold us in place and it will keep you there. It will bind you up. It, it, it will not allow you to move into your destiny that God has for you. That's the purpose of the stronghold. It's to hold you in place, to hold you down, to muzzle you. It'll, it'll muzzle you if you're not careful. Because you won't say, you won't believe, you won't do what God wants you to do. Because of the stronghold in your life. And sometimes our own sins become a stronghold as well. Our own sin will muzzle us. Our own sin will, will give us paranoia almost. Because what sin does, when you fall into to sin, what it does is it brings shame and guilt into your life and you just feel like you can't do anything then because you're not worthy. And it's a lie of the enemy because all you have to do is go to Jesus and say, Jesus, forgive me. I've blown it. And he will forgive you like that and you will be free from that. You don't have to be held by, by, uh, by sin. You don't have to be held by guilt and by shame. You don't have to be held down by strongholds. He's given us weapons to defeat the enemy. He's given us weapons to free us from these strongholds. And that's what I'm going to be talking about here. Because that that's going to be the most important part of today. We cannot live in a place where we can't, we can't, we can't, I can't, I can't. You know, it's interesting, by the time this story ends, you have... 10 spies that said we can't. You have two that actually said we can take the land. It was actually Joshua and Caleb, even though Caleb was the one that spoke up there. It was Joshua and Caleb who believed that they can. Do you know that when they actually did go in to the promised land, everyone in Israel, because all of Israel actually fell into the lie that they said we can't, all of Israel except Joshua and Caleb they all believed that there was no possible way. They all believed the lie. They all said, we can't. And God said, because of that, because you will not believe, all of you will die in the wilderness and only Caleb and Joshua will actually inha inhabit the promised land. That's amazing. One thought, one thought that they believed held them back from their destiny. So what's God speaking to you? What has the enemy spoke to you? Where is this thought that may be in you that says, I can't, I never will. I just don't have enough. I don't have what it takes. What's the limit that the enemy has put on you? What's the thought that was planted in your mind by somebody most likely that you trusted? Because that's, that's, where, the, that's where those thoughts really get planted. 
some, somebody that we love, that we trust, they, they say something to us, and the enemy uses it to just plant a seed. And guess what, man? When a seed is sown into us of, of fear and of doubt, and, and you can't, when that seed gets sown, that seed will grow. And that seed puts its roots down, and you're talking a mighty, mighty stronghold. That's what makes it so strong. Its roots go down, and, and when you've got an oak tree, you, you can't move an oak tree out here. And those things aren't going to move. You could take your car and run into it. It's not going to move because they have deep roots. If the tree was just sitting there, it would actually just topple over. It's too top-heavy. It would just fall over. But its roots go down deep. And if you allow the roots of the lie to go down deep in you, then you've got a serious problem. And you're going to have to pull that thing out. And sometimes I love it when God just breaks something overnight. It's just we lay hands on somebody or they're praying and boom, and it's broken. But a lot of times you're going to have to fight. And you're going to have to pray and you're going to have to go to the word of God and you're going to have to retrain your brain to think the thoughts of God and not the thoughts of the enemy. I'm, I'm giving you something today that, that, I mean, could possibly set your life free. But you'll have to do it. You'll have to do the work. But if you do, freedom and joy and, and just expectancy and a new, a new level, a new place, a new, a new place of freedom will be in you. And, and it's hard because I've been bound up before. I've been bound up by insecurities because of things people said to me. That's exactly how the insecurities, that was my stronghold. It's a stronghold of insecurity about things that were said to me. And, and I, I added to it because I believed it and I would defend it and I would add to it. And now I'm adding on more. I'm just heaping it on, to be honest, compared to what everybody else would say. I'm heaping it on myself. And, and those roots would go down. And I, and I've learned, I learned that it, it takes a while to get out of that, but you can. You can. And what you don't know is you don't know what freedom feels like when you're not free. That's the hard part. Because if I could show you, like if I, could, if I could show you what freedom feels like, you'd be like, yes, I want that. I want that right now. How do I get it there? I'm willing to do that. But when we don't really know what it's like, then it's going to take some work to get out of that thing. But it's worth it. Just, just know that it, it's so worth it, so worth it. 2 Corinthians 10, start at verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we're not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our, warf of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Strongholds, the lie you believe. So our weapons, the weapons of our warfare have divine power to destroy the lies we believe. Think of it that way. We destroy arguments in every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every, th every thought captive to obey Christ. So how do we break the stronghold? That's, this, is, this is the thing that if you're taking notes, if you're going to take anything in today, you've got to understand this. You've got to understand and learn. This is how I'm going to break out of whatever has me. Because that stronghold, that stronghold will lead you to addictions. That stronghold will lead you into all kinds of bad behavior. Anger, frustration, just, just always being miserable, a cynic. And, and God doesn't want you to live that way. He came that we can have life and have it abundantly. So even though in the midst of trouble, we can have abundant life. But if, but if you're bogged down by all those strongholds, then you'll never have that abundant life. Even as a believer, you've got to understand that. Even believers can have strongholds in their lives. Because he saves us just the way we are, and he cleans us up as we go. It's called sanctification. We become more like him, little by little by little. So we aren't, we aren't, um, we're, we're, made, we're made perfect through the blood of Jesus, but we still deal with a lot of stuff. And so, and so he's going to bring us to these places. He's going to show us, and it's going to be up to us to do the work. So here's a couple examples of, of how we begin to make a stronghold submit or obey to the word of God, how we take it captive. Okay, this is how you do it. So a thought comes to your mind. It says, I can't. But you know that the word of God says, all things are possible to him who believes. A thought comes to your mind, no one loves me. But the word says, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. A thought comes to your mind, everyone's against me. But the word says, for I know the plans 
I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you hope and a future. A thought comes to your mind, I'll never forgive them. But, but then the word says, bear with each other and forgive one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Another thought, we'll never have enough. But the word says, my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. And he's got a lot of money. He's got it all. And if my needs are going to be supplied according to his riches, every need in your life is going to be met forever. As long as you're alive, every need will be met. Some of you may be saying, like me, I don't know how I'm going to retire. You know what I've been, I, 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 that, was, that was a real thing for me for a long time. I was really scared about that. It's beginning to change. And, I, and I'm not going to say that it's fully changed. It's beginning to change though. It's beginning to change because I have watched God too many times pull us through one thing or another and he's always given more than enough. I don't understand that. I'll never understand it because I'm not an accountant, but I kind of act like one to be quite honest. And, and it's kind of like in me and it doesn't make sense on paper. His provision never makes sense on paper. One, one thing that, that um, Pastor Brad had said this morning was, was that um, you give generously. So when we give, we're supposed to give generously. And you, what, what a lot of people don't, don't understand, because it doesn't make sense to our brain, is that when you give to the Lord, to the Lord, whether it's here at the church, at a ministry, even giving to somebody else to bless somebody else. When you give of tithes and offerings, tithes, what you bring to the church, offerings would be anything above that, or maybe what you're doing outside the church. When you give like that, there is a supernatural blessing on you that you cannot figure out on paper. It doesn't work that way. He supersedes what the natural would be. And he provides for you in ways that you had no idea could come across. I have had many times in my, in my and, and, and believe me, I'm not a thief. I had many times in my, unless you are, are you a thief? I don't think so. I've had times in my, in my life where I'm like, I don't know why there's this much money in our account. I don't understand what's happening. How, how, how is it accumulating when we keep spending, you know, what we've got to? We don't have much, but how is it doing that? And, I, and I've, I've watched that happen, I don't know how many times. Bills that need to be paid, somehow they get billed. We don't have groceries. Somebody comes over and they bring groceries. And we watched a lot of things, especially when we were younger. Provision for our kids. People would bring us bags of clothes, sometimes bags of clothes. We're just like, this is awesome. Praise God. Because we didn't know how we were going to get it. We've had groceries just show up at our doorstep. We've had people buy, uh, 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 pay off a car, not buy a car, but pay off a car. Actually, later on in our life, we did have somebody buy us a car. $10,000 paid for it. They didn't know a penny. This is what God will do when you begin to give, when you begin to pursue after him, when you begin to allow things to change in your life. See, I think it's all of it. I don't think just because you give of tithes and offerings. The Bible does say that the windows of heaven will be open. So there it is. But I believe that it's all of it. Man, the more you pursue him, the more you press in with him, the more you're willing to change, the more you're willing to give, even compliments to other people. You're lifting up other people. You're not concerned about yourself anymore. You're just a giver. You're a giver in every area of your life. And as you live that kind of life, the blessing of God is just poured out on you in a powerful way. It just is. It's poured out in a powerful way. He will set things up in certain ways so that you're blessed. He'll even set you up in a way that, that um, sometimes so that you just have enough and sometimes that you have more than enough. We live in a house right now that I, that, that I personally think is, is just a, a major blessing of God. And it's, a, and it's a long story, but God blessed us way back. And now because of that, we live in a, in a, in a nice home. And it was way back then. And I, I just, I've just watched God's hand move in such amazing, incredible ways. And so there's a lot of blessing in the Christian life when you're, when you're doing all these things, when you got like everything working together. It's an incredible thing. And that's why we're so adamant that, that we pursue God, that you pursue God, that you learn to do this, that you actually do it. Don't just hear it. It's a great idea. I need to do that one day. No, do it now. Do these things now. Let change begin to happen in your life. Some of these changes will, you, you'll actually find, will bring immediate blessing into your life, immediate peace into your life. 
I, I don't know about you, but, but I would rather be poor and be peaceful than be, be rich and be miserable. God can do both. I've seen him do both, but I've seen him bring pre- peace even when things aren't right. Paul even said, I think it was Paul, wasn't it Paul that said, I've learned to be content in all things? You know, it's just, whether, whether I've got much or I've got little, I just, I just learn to be content because, because God is my provider. God is my father. God is my king. He's not gonna let me fail. He's not gonna let, let everything just fall apart. And so I've come to this place that, that I personally know, even though um, there's not a whole lot for, for retirement right now, there's gonna be a way. There will be a way. He will provide. It's going to happen. And it's, and it's almost gonna be interesting looking, looking you know, forward going, I wonder how he's gonna do it. And then looking back saying, oh, that's how he did it. Because I know he's going to. And so, so this, this is how we have to live our lives though. We, we take every thought captive and we take the word of God and we combat it and we beat it down. And when you do that, so, so again, if we, go back to, if we go back to no one loves me, no one loves me, I'm, I'm depressed, no one loves me. And I find this scripture, the pastor said, put the scripture on your, on your mirror. He said, put it on your refrigerator. He said, put it on your dashboard. And so I did that. And so now I'm, I'm reading this. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. So that day I made a little bit of progress. And guess what? The next day I'm going to make more progress. And I'm going to continue to make progress. And one of the, one of the most greatest potential ways for you to make even more progress is to begin to pray that scripture. So now I'm, I'm, I'm depressed, but I'm, I'm starting to break out a little bit. I start praying. I said, I'm going to pray this scripture. The, the pastor said to pray the scripture. So, so I, here's, a, here's just an example. Father, I just, I just come before you. God, God, you know, God, I just feel alone. I feel very depressed. And I feel like there's just nobody, God, that loves me. But God, your word says that the steadfast, last, uh, the, the, steadful, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. It never ceases, God. God, you said it, your love, your love for me. Your love, God, your love for me, God. You love me. That's what the word says. Your love, your love will never cease in my life, God. So God, I pray right now, Father, let me never say that no one loves me because you do. You do, God. You do, God. And I pray. I pray, God, that you break the yoke of bondage over my heart. God, that love, your love would be poured out to me in the name of Jesus. That was stronger than the first service. I don't know who that was for, but dang, somebody took that, I think. (laughs) You don't have to believe the lie. In fact, stop believing the lie. You need to stop. You need to stop. And the way that you're going to stop is you're going to smash that lie down by, by taking scripture and heaping it on top of it. You just keep finding new scripture after new scripture. Google it. Do whatever you've got to do. Maybe you've got some kind of concordance. However you want to do it, you find scriptures and you keep reading them and you keep, you keep praying over them. And guess what's going to happen? Your thought is going to begin to switch to God does love me. God's love never ceases. I'm going to be okay. That was a lie. And you identify the lie and you walk out of that thing. And you have just captivated the lie that had you. And that's how you do it. It it takes that kind of work. But it's not that hard. I mean, it's really not to be free. Think about some some of you. Some of you have been been free. I mean, or or have been free for a while is what I meant to say. And, and, And you know what it feels like. But imagine, I mean, like to be free. Like, I can really be free if I'll just do these things. This is the power of this message today. It, it can set you free, completely, 100% set you free. Uh, John 8, 31, 32 says, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And if you will know the truth, the truth will set you free. If you'll know the truth and repeat the truth and begin to believe the truth, that's, that's where it is. It's to know it, believe it, you'll be set free. The moment you believe that over the lie, freedom will come into your life. Freedom, pure freedom. So when the negative thought comes into your life, make it submit. Make it submit. Push it back. Romans 8, 5, and 6. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. 
But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. Oh, to have a mind that's governed by the Spirit. You know, you can get there. I, I, don't, I don't know if you actually believe that right now for some of you, but you can get there. My mind, and I believe my wife's mind, is far more dominated by the Spirit than it is the flesh. And it wasn't always that way. At least it wasn't with me. It wasn't always that way, but I had to train myself. I had to retrain myself. I had to renew my mind, the Bible says, through the reading of the Word, by constantly washing my mind with the Word. It's got to just keep coming in. It's got to keep coming in. You've got to start to believe it. Start to believe it. We've overcome great things that the enemy has thrown at us because of the Word of God. Because faith begins to arise. Because we early on, when we begin to see a problem, we don't just run and cower and hide. And what are we going to do? And we call people and we talk about it and all that kind of stuff. And we're just so miserable. And No, man, we run to God. Then we've got to pray. And we'll, we'll encourage one another to stand up. If one gets down, the other one starts picking the other one up. And if you don't have anybody else to do that, then you just turn to the Word. Because God's Word will always pick you up. God's Word will always give you life. It will always transform your, your, your thinking. And in that moment, when everything's going crazy, guess what? You can actually have peace. When you fully get to the place that says, God, I trust you. Everything's havoc right now. It's a mess. I don't know what to do. But God, I trust you. That's a great, I mean, and I, I'm saying to a place that you're not just saying that by faith. It's good to do that. But where you really believe it, where it really sinks in, where it's become part of who you are. It, it's just, God, I, I, I know it. And, and, and let me just say, today, if something came across you know, on the phone or whatever. And it was really pretty tragic, pretty like, oh my gosh, now what are we going to do? I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I will probably feel the, uh, the shock just like anybody else would. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sense that. I'm, I'm going to feel that. I am, I am human. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sense and feel that. But very quickly, I, I make a decision in my mind to replace what the enemy wants to bring in as a thought of destruction, of defeat, of, of you know, financial ruin or or they're sick. Oh my gosh, they're going to die. You know, these thoughts that, that things haven't even happened yet in our mind just goes to the worst case scenario. You know, it's, it's amazing how that, how that happens. But we very quickly, we, we learn to shut it down and we run to the word and we pray and we worship. We do exactly what we tell you guys to do. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, we, we give you things out that we practice ourselves. We don't just, we don't just kind of wing this off because we heard it from somebody else some book that we read or some preacher or whatever that we saw on YouTube or, or online or something, you know, no, we've lived this and we've walked this out and we will continue. I, I can honestly say now, I will never fall away from God. I'm not. I never will. I never will. And I'm going to keep fighting and I'm going to keep fighting for my family. I'm not going to give up on my family. I've been through too much, to be honest, and I've seen too many victories. I've seen losses and I've seen victories and I've seen losses again and I've seen victories again. So I refuse to give up because I know the enemy's ways and I know that God is more powerful than the enemy. <laughs> Period. And that's where, I, and I've, I'm serious about that. I, I lived that way last night. Last night, I told, I told you guys, um, I, I don't know when it was, two or three years ago. Um, I told you when our kids were going through some things, I would be in bed and I, I sleep well, you know, just so you know, I, I really do. I sleep well. And I would get woken up at night by this sound. It sounded like somebody was at the door and it was loud and I, and I would wake up. Nothing else going on. It wasn't part of a dream and somebody's not going to do No, it was just bang, 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 bang. And I would have that quite often. And my kids were going through some really, really tough times. And I knew every time that I heard that knock, I realized we need to pray. We need to pray. And um, though we wound up seeing major, major incredible victories, um, there were many times, I'm going to say most times, all but a few times, <laughs> okay, being honest here, all but a few times I would stay in bed when I felt like God was saying, 
I need to get up and pray. And I would stay in bed, and I would pray right there in bed. And I'm just talking about my life, what, God is, what God's doing in me. I needed to get up. I needed to, to, to ready myself, so to speak, to pray more than, oh, God, okay, whatever's going on, God, just help them. Oh, Father, just, just be with them right now. <laughs> you know, I, I needed more than that. You know, I, I, needed, I needed to get out of bed. I needed to do war. And I wasn't, I wasn't as sharp at that as I wanted to be. And, um, and maybe I'm still growing in it, but I can tell you that last night I was very successful in it. So every time in the past I heard four knocks, I, I don't know, maybe it's all about numbers, I don't know. Maybe Joe or somebody can, can tell me later on, I, I don't know. Um, there were four times uh, in the past. This time it was only two. And it was just last night, and it was, it, it sounded like if I don't have a headboard that you could wrap on like that, a wood headboard, it sounded like somebody knocked on it right there. That's what it sounded like. And I woke up, and I, and I was kind of doing that sleepy thing like, okay, well, who am I praying for? What's going on? What's happening? What do I need to do here? And I, and I, and I began to pray. And I, and I could tell that I was, I was getting, you know, I was kind of getting, okay, so that's what it is. You know, as you pray, you don't know what to pray for sometimes, but as you pray, it's almost like things become revealed a little bit. And so I'm praying, and I, and I can see what I'm praying about. And, and he says, I need you to get out of bed and kneel at your chair. And chair's in the other room. I knew which chair he was talking about. It's a chair that I, that I study in. And... Um, so I did. It was 1.24 in the morning when I woke up. And um, so I got up. And I went out and I prayed. And I, and I got to be honest with you, my flesh th- says, thank God he didn't ask me to pray all night long because I didn't want to, to be honest. I prayed for about 15 minutes. It was almost 15, 15 to 20 minutes, probably 20 minutes from when it started. And I prayed for 15 minutes. And I did what maybe some of the older people in here might know as a term called pray through. When you pray through, you pray long enough to know that the breakthrough has happened. You sense it in your spirit. You sense something just broke. There's a breakthrough. There's an ease. There's peace all of a sudden. And so I prayed through, and I prayed until that peace hit. And I, and I did, actually, I could say before God, I prayed a little bit more that, that, that God would intervene in the situation, that God would be there, that there would be protection. I'm just, just kind of praying, almost putting like a, like the cherry on top, so to speak. And, and then I went back to bed and I just <laughs> fell back asleep. But that's what it takes. That's what it takes if you want to see victory in your family, if you want to see victory in your own life, if there's something that's going on in your own mind. It takes that kind of heart that will fight. Reading it in a book doesn't do it. Hearing about it at church doesn't do it. The fight happens on your ground, on your territory, and you've got to be the one to stand and fight. And I just say this, guys, don't let your women only be the ones that fight. You need to stand up and fight for your family. I'm, I'm just, I, I don't even know, I, I, just see, I just see there's a biblical pattern in the Bible. I can't say this is what the Bible says, but there's a bit of biblical pattern in the Bible where the husband, um, the, the father, uh, has authority over that house. And so when the husband or, or the, the, the father will, will begin to pray and draw a line in the sand with the enemy, the enemy doesn't just get louder. The enemy shrinks. He's afraid of you. Now, he's afraid of you too, mamas, believe me. He is. But there's something special when the father will speak up. Why do you think the enemy wants to take the dads out? And he's been very, very, very successful at it. And so the world doesn't know what to do. So the world says, we need more police. We, we need, we need, we need, we need um, people in the school that can keep our kids safe. We need, we need all of this stuff. We need more counselors. Can I be honest? If we had really strong, godly moms and dads in the home, Amen. almost every problem would go away. It'd still be the rebel, but it wouldn't be like it is today. They wouldn't get away with it. Kids would be disciplined in the proper way, with love, but with discipline. And we're all afraid to discipline our kids, and it's ridiculous. Kids shouldn't run our homes. The parents run the homes. You got all that for free, because I don't know where that all that <laughs> first service didn't get that. Uh, 
Okay, I need, I need to give you this because this is such a key that's so important. Philippians 4, verses 4 to 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. I say again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. I, I love that statement, the Lord is near. How you just like threw it in there. Because it's with peace and it's with gentleness. The Lord is near. So it's like, if he's near, everything's okay. Verse 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in every, t- and in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, I want to back us up. Just, just go, to, go to verse 6 again. Do not be anxious about anything. And then listen to what it says. By prayer and petition, with thanksgiving. When I was studying this, I don't know if it was this scripture or if it was a different one, but I had an aha moment, and I want you to have an aha moment today. A lot of us will go to God and we will pray. And we'll pray over a situation, we'll pray for our kids or whatever, but we miss something that, that, that is right there in front of us with thanksgiving. With thanksgiving. And I'm telling you that somebody in here today, and I believe it in the first service and I believe it in this one, may, may, I, don't, I hope you catch it right here today. But one of the things that will bring you through, like will bring you through and get you to the breakthrough is not just praying, because sometimes we can pray out of fear, right? But we pray in faith, but guess what? In that time, we also give thanks. And I think that we give thanks for just things generally in our life, but I think you can also say, God, I thank you right now for bringing what I'm praying for to pass, God. I know that this is going to happen. God, I thank you right now. But I think also we even need just to be, have a thankful heart because a lot of times when, when problems are going on in our life, all we do is get inner focused. We're just so focused on ourselves. We're not thankful anymore. We're just worried about the problem. We just want the problem to go away. We just want the problem to go away, and we forget to be thankful. Be thankful. Debbie, be thankful. In the midst of all of it, be thankful. If you're going through something, I don't care what it looks like, be thankful, because you've got things you can think about to be thankful for. You do. You do. There are so many things that God has brought you through already. If you're like 10 years old, you've got things you could be thankful for that you know about. Just life is hard. That, that's, that's the reality. So don't, don't, think, don't think this morning that, that you're the only one that has a hard life. We've all had hard lives. Every single person in here. Well, not like mine. Well, you're not like mine either. I mean, we could do that all day long. It's, life is hard. Life is hard. And about the time you find out that you've got the worst problem in the room, somebody else is going to walk in here and there's even worse. You're like... You win. You know, it's just like your problem's worse than mine. Okay. But the truth of the matter is the worst problem is the one you're going through right now. And that problem is hard because you, it feels like you, you just feel trapped. You can't see through the, through the forest, you know. You know, you can't see through the trees. And, and, it's, and it's tough. But God can bring you out. God desires to bring you out. That's what he does. He, he's the miracle maker. He's the way maker like we heard this morning. He's the one that pulls us through these things. He loves doing that. He, he loves the game of chase like we talked about last, last week, you know, where we're just, we're just chasing after him. We're just pursuing after him. He'll, he'll allow certain things that to happen in our lives because he loves that pursuit. But he loves to bring us out too because then we can point to him and say, God, it's all because of you. You get the glory, God. You get the glory. You get the glory. So you guys, you guys many of you also know this story, um, and then we'll be done here with the, the woman with the issue of blood. Many, many in here know that story. Um, one of the most popular stories in the Bible. It's, and this one is from Mark 5. It starts at verse 24. So Jesus is getting ready right now to go to one of the temple leaders' home because his daughter is very sick. His young daughter is very sick. And so this crowd everywhere, like they're pressing in, this crowd, they're all, and they're all going to, to this guy's house to heal his daughter. That's what they're going to see Jesus do this. And so everybody's pressing in. There's a big crowd. Verse 25, and it says, And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. 
when she heard about Jesus, she came up uh, behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought she had a thought. She had a thought in her mind that went against all the other thoughts that said you'll never be healed. This bleeding will never stop. It's already been 12 years. You've already spent all your money. You're never going to get healed. But she had a thought. If I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. That one thought brought victory into her life. That one thought declared to all the other thoughts, and it, and it said, you're the loser. This thought is the winner. Jesus is the victor. You are defeated. It brought immediate defeat to all the other thoughts that said, you'll never be that person. You'll never be healed. You're going to have this the rest of your life. One thought, one thought, one thought. What's the one thought that you need today? What's the one thought that you need to start thinking to turn everything around? You need to find the scripture that, that, that's going to defeat the thought, that's going to captivate the thought, the lie, the stronghold from the enemy. And you need to take that scripture and you need to believe it. You need to take it on the inside and really come to a place where you believe it and you're going to see things change. You're going to watch darkness flee from your life. Flee. I mean, it freaks him out. I'm telling you, it does. It freaks him out. And he's not as strong as he wants us all to believe. He's strong. I'll, I'll never limit him. He's strong. But I'm telling you, God is stronger. And when your faith is mixed with the power of God, he will run. He will lose. I experienced it last night. I'm telling you, that's when I, when I broke through. I, I knew the enemy's hold, the enemy's grip, whatever the enemy's scheme was at that moment, it, it broke. It was chased away. He must flee. Submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee. I saw it last night, and I see it quite often. I see it sometimes when we're praying for people. That same power that, that's in me, is, is, that's Christ in me, that same power is in you as believers. You just got to start believing it. You got to start believing that you're not some mealy mouse person that has no power, that, that God will never use. God desires to use all of us. He gave us the baptism of the Holy Spirit so that we can walk in power. That, that's exactly what dunamis means. That's the Greek word for that. Power. Power. Dynamite power. Dynamite explodes things. I don't, I don't know if you realize it. It's just like, hey, he gives you a little hammer and chisel. No, he gives you dynamite power. To break the bondages off of people. To break the stronghold that's off of your mind. To break the stronghold that's in your children. Parents, if, you're, if your kids are going through a struggle right now, you need to pray. You need to get some scripture. You need to, I, re, I remember um, one of our kids, Tina tells this story better than I do, but one of our kids had just this thing with fear. Every night he, he would go to sleep and, and he was fearful. He'd, he'd just be afraid of something in the room or whatever. And Tina would, she, she'd take scripture and she, she started to get him to uh, memorize it, but she would put it under his pillow. Now, there wasn't anything inherited about putting it under the pillow. It's going to saturate into your head. There's nothing. That, that's, don't, don't get weird. We're not that kind of church. <laughs> she would put it there just so that he knew that it was there. The word of God was there. That promise. You've got to find the promise. You've got to find the promise that's going to combat and captivate what the enemy has lied to you about. Amen? I'm going to stop right there. Hallelujah. So I don't want us to leave without giving everybody in here just an opportunity to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior because we're, we're in a series called Transformed. And you will never be fully transformed until you know Jesus first as your Lord and Savior. He brings the transformation. Like I said, he, he takes you, accepts you just the way you are. doesn't matter what you've done in your life. That's, that's the amazing thing about God. doesn't matter what you've done, how, how bad you've been, how much you've blown it. Um, your last sin was just a moment ago, your last thought, you know, whatever. He will accept you if you will take the thought that Jesus loves you. Just start there. Because Jesus does love you. It says, it says that um, for God so loved the world, the world, that's you, that's me, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, his only one and only son to die for us. That whosoever, that's all of us, 
that whosoever, whoever would believe in him would not perish, but will have eternal life. What's that mean? Are we all going to die? Yeah, we're all going to die physically. But then there's another world. There's the world of the eternal. Do you want eternal life or eternal death? Eternal life is being with Jesus. That's forever with him. In perfect peace, where there's no more weeping, no more crying, the Bible says. The beauty of heaven, which I just can't wait to see. Or there's eternal death. And this option is given to all of us. And we have the right to choose whichever one we want to. God will not force you. He will not force anyone to make the choice to know him and believe in him and to ask for forgiveness. He gives us the choice to literally deny him also. And today, I hope you'll take the choice to receive him as your Lord and Savior and not the choosing of eternal death where you're separated him forever. And everything good will not be there. It's eternal punishment. And it is forever. That's what the Bible says. But you have an option today. It's an incredible option. To ask for forgiveness of your sins. First John 1, uh, uh, First John 1 9 says that, that if, if we will ask for forgiveness, he will forgive us of our sins. It's that simple. But what, what gets in the way is our own humility. You have to realize that you're a sinner. You have to say, I am a sinner. Like your world's messed up right now, but guess what? You're part of the problem. And when we believe and understand that I'm part of the problem, that I'm a sinner as well, not just everybody around me, but when I realize that I'm a sinner, then I can boldly come before, or I can honestly come before God and say, God, I'm a sinner and I need forgiveness for my sins. I know the rest of the world's a mess, but God, I need you. Because in the end, in the end, you will stand before God. It'll be you and him. Me and him. That's how it works. And when I stand before him, because I'm a born-again believer, he's simply going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Come on in. But if you do not know him, it says that you will stand there and you'll knock at the door and he'll say, I don't know you. In fact, I never knew you. And he will reject you. And that's your choice. That's the options that lay before you today. I would encourage you to humble your heart and say right now, God, I have sinned. And because of what Jesus did on the cross, his blood, his blood, only his blood washes our sins away. That's why he went on the cross. That's why we have Easter. He went to the cross so his blood could be poured out so that our sins could be forgiven. What a trade. It's just amazing. So as he forgives our sins, he, on that cross, he then died. They buried him for three days and he rose up from the dead. So his sin washes our sins away. His blood washes our sins away. But his resurrection defeats death and hell forever. Forever. So bow your head and close your eyes. Maybe you're out there today and and you could honestly say, man, I've I've never heard a message like this before. I've never heard you talk about Jesus like that, his blood and, and sin in my life, and I need to ask for forgiveness. Maybe you're Maybe you're out there and you say, but that's me. That's, I, I need to do that today. I need to make that decision. I need to ask him to forgive me of my sin. Because I, after all, I, I want heaven. I don't want hell. But maybe you're out there today saying, I'm, I'm not sure. I just don't, I don't know if I were to die today, would I go to heaven or would I go to hell? I don't, I don't know where exactly I sit with God. I, I just say, let's make it really simple for all of us and for you especially. Let's just take a moment and ask Jesus to forgive us of our sin no matter what you think, and and let's just get it right before him. So it's almost like if you're unsure, let's just start over. And let's ask him to be the Lord of our life. Let's ask him to forgive us of our sins. So with nobody looking around and nobody moving for just a moment, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray. And I'm I'm going to, before I pray, I'm going to ask people who really truly want to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. And nobody's going to be looking around. You'll put your hand up. I'll, I'll probably acknowledge you. And then you just put it back down. And then with everybody's eyes still closed, we're just all going to pray together. Everybody's going to pray. But there's something that needs to happen in you today. And I think that, that's putting your hand forward. And, and maybe you could be water baptized next week or something like that. But you need to lift your hand up today. Just, just acknowledge this. Man, that's me. That's me. So if that's you, you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And you'd like to ask him to forgive you today. Or you can honestly say, man, I I don't know. I'm just, I'm a little confused, but I want to make things right today. If that's you on either of those occasions, would you just raise your hand up real high right now? 
just saying, I want to say yes to Jesus today. Is there anybody in here, if your heart is beating real fast, because you, you may have been coming to this church for six months, and God may still be talking to you today. So if it's you, your heart's probably beating kind of fast right now. You, you're wanting to put your arm up, but you're holding it back. That's the Holy Spirit. He's talking to you right now. If that's you, I encourage you, just lift your hand up real quick, real high. Okay, it's all right. I don't see any this morning, and that's okay. We have one, one little guy, but he's a little guy. <laughs> Pray with me anyway. Everyone together, just say, Father God, thank you for sending Jesus. Jesus, I thank you. I thank you that your blood was shed. And I thank you that you died on the cross. Thank you for rising from the dead and defeating sin and death. This morning I ask you, forgive me of all of my sins every single one of them. I laid them at the cross this morning. And right now, because of your blood, I receive your forgiveness. Thank you for forgiving me. I ask you now to be my Lord and Savior forever. Come into my life and change me. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, praise God, praise God. I don't know if, if anybody did or not this morning. I know we had three in the first service, so I'm, 